All right, so today we're going to do a bit of an anatomy of an SAP project. I think there's definitely, you know, specific trends and methodologies that we'd like to talk about today. And so first we're going to go into the anatomy of an SAP program. Then we're going to talk about greenfield and brownfield migrations. We're going to do a bit of an overview on the SAP DevOps and CICD pipeline um, content. And then we're going to talk about our Tricentis methodology and toolkit. So with that, so my name is Wes Leffel. Um, I've been with Tricentis for coming up on a year now. And I think prior to that, my background is 14 plus years of SAP delivery. Um, and I'm excited to be here today. Um, I like to open with this slide because I think this quote is great, right? We have to learn the rules of the game and then we have to play better than anyone else. Um, you know, when we get into these big SAP projects, I think there is this you know, mindset that success has to be the straight arrow, right? We're going to define a timeline. We're going to define a budget. We're going to set a resource pool, right? Define our teams and we're going to be successful. And the truth is much more that it really is much more messy when we, when we get into these programs. And so today we're kind of going to take the lens of, you know, knowing that it's not always a straight line, um, you know, how are ways to straighten that line? And I think within Tricentis, we have a, a tool set and a methodology that definitely help. So who is Tricentis? I think, you know, we are kind of the quadrant leading um, test automation suite at this, at this point. Uh, in 2020, we announced a partnership with SAP, right? Where we have both OEM products as well as reselling our own products. Um, and the results speak for themselves. I mean, all of these companies that are, you know, acquiring and leveraging our tool set and methodology are seeing huge increases in both, you know, speed and efficiency in terms of delivery, which then allows them to go faster and meet timelines and budgets and everything else. Um, our partner network is growing every day. Um, you know, Accenture, Infosys, Cognizant, IBM, et cetera. Um, and then we also have alliances with, you know, a bunch of the other big names out there, Microsoft, SAP, we're big fans of Jira, that whole tool set. Um, and yeah, continuing on. So when we start to talk about SAP programs or projects themselves, we, we sort of see things fall into three buckets, right? What we call staying fit, getting ready and making the move. And so staying fit is someone who's perhaps already on S4 and or thinking about making improvements to their core ECC system, right? And so staying fit is all around finding ways to streamline and optimize what, what you already have. And I think our platform of applications fit right in that, you know, we see a lot of reusability uh, between the platforms when we move from ECC to something like S4. And so any work that customers want to pursue in terms of automation is, is not necessarily throwaway. Um, when we talk about getting ready, the second bucket, this is people who are actively planning to move to, to S4, right? And so this is where we see the lion's share of customers in their SAP journeys at this point. I think something like 45 to 50% of customers are either actively planning or in the midst of some S4 transformation, right? And the final phase is making the move. And I think we see about 25% of the industry having made the move to, to S4 or at least started that journey, I think. Um, when we talk about large customers, they typically have multiple systems to consider. And so it's not uncommon for a large company to have five, 10, 15 ECC systems. And I think when we talk about making the move, um, you know, over time, we're gonna wanna migrate all of those things. And I think, you know, 25% is relative to people who have moved maybe at least one or started down that journey. Um, on the right side, on the right side of the slide, we always talk about, you know, what to test, does it work and does it scale? And so I think that's th three themes that we're kind of gonna revisit as we continue through this. When we get a little deeper into the journeys, um, th there's multiple aspects here. And so, um, you know, when we talk about S4 migrations, there are flavors of S4 migrations is probably the easiest way to say it. Um, we see what we call greenfield uh, and brownfields, and we're going to get into those in depth in a little bit. Greenfield is primarily, you know, reimagining or, or starting fresh, um, converting from ECC systems to an S4 system. 
Brownfield is really more a pure conversion play. And then we see all the new stuff from SAP, like Rise, the, the cloud offerings, industry cloud, C4 cloud, et cetera. Um, when we talk about upgrades, upgrades exist throughout the SAP ecosystem. So within ECC, as well as within S4 and within the HANA database itself. Um, SAP releases typically a new S4 version every year. The most recent one was 2020 from last year, preceded by 1909. And then we see the HANA database revisions uh, come out more frequently. When we talk about doing any of these um, activities, right, implementing an S4 system, et cetera, there's huge amounts of testing um, that are typically involved, as well as when we get into smaller activities or more tactical activities like upgrades to your application or your HANA database, there is still a need to test to confirm everything is, is still working. Um, the last bucket is really supporting the SAP practice. And this is this is sort of the ongoing work. So, you know, anyone who has an SAP system essentially has a bit of an SAP practice. You need teams in place to support the modules that you have. And this is where something like DevOps comes in, right? DevOps is the concept of, you know, maintaining the existing system as well as a mechanism for improving and having incremental functionality introduced. CICD pipelines are sort of the technology tool set used to do that. And this is an area um, where SAP themselves are investing now and we're seeing some growth. So now hey, a little Wesley, bit about- so, Sorry to interrupt. Ahead. No, j just to mention to the participants that if they have any questions, I'm monitoring the I just the want Q to mention to the participants that in I, case they have any questions, I'm monitoring the Q&A session. So, your question in English or Portuguese, and uh, we'll, we can answer that immediately. Yeah, yeah perfect. I should have mentioned that yeah. from the get-go. We, we want this session to be uh, collaborative. If you guys have questions, definitely ask. And I think Valeria or Juan Carlos, if, if people are asking yes. questions, um, please just interrupt me and I will stop and try and answer the questions. I, I will. Perfect. So I just mentioned that as well. So uh, good. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you. So now to get into, you know, the Tricentis methodologies, methodology. So we call this shift left, right? And it's all grounded on these three questions, starting from the right and shifting back to the left. What to test, does it work, and does it scale? And so we've developed a series of tools that help answer these questions systematically, right? So the first question, what to test? Well, that's where we introduce CIA or change impact analysis, you know, when you go to plan a regression test or a system integration test, which we'll talk more about in a minute, it really starts with first the question, well, what do we need to test, right? And that question is logically, or it logically precedes the question, well, what changed, right? And that's sort of what change impact allows us to systematically identify is, you know, based on what I'm changing in my SAP system, right? Based on my transports, I wanna leverage a tool to actually extrapolate what is changing in the system and how those changed objects impact all the other objects in the system. And then going a step further, how those changes are then represented or covered in the test suite that we have. And so there's a lot to unpack in there and we'll get into that in a minute, but it is, it is very powerful to be able to make a change in an SAP system, know how that change proliferates through the system, and then know systematically through our platform Here's all the test cases you need to run, and here's all the places where you have gaps in testing coverage. And that is the essence of what we call the hits and the gaps. Hits in terms of where we have coverage and gaps in terms of where we need to go create additional test cases based on the objects that are changing. Does it work? This is um, our core Tricentis Tosca or ECT, Enterprise Continuous Testing by Tricentis platform, where you actually go in and create the automation. This is where you, create your test scripts based on modules, no code, low code, all of that exists in there. You, you know, through the automation can log into the SAP system, can create a purchase rack, can execute a sales order, can do a delivery confirmation. You can do all of these things. Um, the final question, does it scale? We, an we answer this with our SAP enterprise performance testing. And this is really more like traditional load or performance testing, except much better than the days of Load Runner and some of our previous competitors. Um, 
as part of every SAP implementation, so a greenfield or a brownfield, you're going to have to go through a process of performance or load testing the application. So the first thing you'll do is go through a, your sizing exercise with SAP where you'll say, this is how big we think the system needs to be. And as you work through your implementation, you're going to want to come back and performance and load test that. And I think, you know, there's a few different components that you want to make sure to performance and load test. First is going to be the core application infrastructure. On top of that, if you have complex developments, those become a target for potential performance testing, as well as any of your integrations, right? SAP systems are highly transactional in nature. And I think via enterprise performance load testing, you really can start to replicate meaningful loads on the system. So, you know, it may work when our development team creates it and we do a system integration test or a UAT, but how is that going to work when we do 100 users, 1,000 users, 10,000 users, right? How's it going to work during the holiday season um, in the U.S., what we call Black Friday and Cyber Monday, where we have year-over-year -year exponential growth in the online shopping, right? How can that same integration that was tested up to 10,000 people support 100,000 people, a million people, et cetera, right? This is where we can try to help answer those questions uh, as we build and um, try to bring stability and resilience to the, to the SAP landscape. So when we talk about the SAP projects, this is back to the greenfield and brownfield. You know, the projects are still managed by traditional objects, very complex project timelines, very detailed resource planning, and very complicated budgets, right? The landscapes themselves, if anyone has been involved in any of these larger SAP um, projects and companies, the landscapes are or can be enormous, multiple core ECC systems, very complex reporting layers, right? And it's not uncommon to see these systems have 500,000, 1,500 RICEPs, which is a term we use to describe the customizations um, within these applications. And that's agnostic of the hundreds of integration points that are typically um, present. And I think while these systems revolve around the core ECC and S4 systems, the non-SAP systems involved are typically quite exhaustive. You know, there are many applications today that are what are dubbed kind of best in breed. So things like ServiceNow, Jira, Workday, the list goes on, right? We now have all the other um, integration components like MuleSoft, or you could get into reporting layers like Power BI or service virtualization and um, data virtualization solutions, right? So we see these landscapes evolving. And I think the needs to test and the best practices for doing that, not only have to worry about the core SAP system, but they have to worry about all of these integrations all the reporting, right, the conversions, et cetera. And so, you know, we'll kind of use these terms to, to continue to ground the conversation as we move forward. So typical timelines, um, this is just, it looks like a question popped up. Please interrupt me if it's um, relevant. I think when we talk about SAP project timelines, um, you know, simple things like ECC and S4 upgrades typically take something like three to six months and will involve your entire team as well as folks from basis and infrastructure and your hyperscalers and your Linux operating system provider, et cetera, right? Greenfield implementations, um, you know, those typically take even longer. We see those ranging, you know, seven, eight, nine months on the, on the quickest side. And you know, they can expand out 24 months if you're really going to do a complete re-engineering of, of some of your core and of your core systems, business processes, as well as the integration layers, your enterprise architecture, et cetera. Um, brownfield implementations typically go faster because they are much more like a conversion. It's not technically a lift and shift because you have a platform change. Right, but you will really are trying to minimize change in the brownfield, and that's sort of the mantra. You really want to take what you have, the data you have, the business process you have, and build and model that in something uh, like a newer S4 system. You also then have newer industry cloud or SAP cloud offerings, and this is um, also blanket terminology for the RISE initiative. I think these can vary widely in scope, um, scope, timeline, resource, and budget, right? Um, if a company has a large instance, so there are situations now where some of these legacy companies have 
ECC instances that are physically so big, right? Beyond say 15 terabytes or so, you know, it's not uncommon to see systems ranging in 10, 20, 30, 40 terabytes. You know, there are not HANA systems that are capable of singular, singularly containing that legacy ECC database. And so now with things like the SAP Cloud and the RISE initiative, we're really looking for creative ways to kind of pull some of that content apart perhaps put core purchasing in one system, run a central finance system um, as ways to make the data volume smaller and exist in smaller systems so that um, benefits can be realized. It can be cheaper, easier to maintain. You get more uh, nimbleness out of that system so that you can um, complete things like mergers and acquisitions and everything else. So there's, there's definitely a, a big play in the newer um, offerings from SAP. Hey Wesley, a couple of questions as, yeah, as, as uh, uh, just to allow more for a conversation here. Uh, Raldo uh, uh, asks a question about uh, if you have any experience with uh, integration between SAP Financial and Sistema Primavera. Uh, Raldo, I don't know if uh, that's a, mm. a, 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 a you make a translation, it's like a spring system or it's like a, a system in uh, for the Brazilian market? Yeah, for sure. So um, yeah. per, so I actually know a, a little bit about Pre, Primavera. Um, mm -hmm. I believe there are standard connectors that exist, but what I would say now is that, you know, you're, you're still going to need some solution architects and enterprise architects to really string, you know, to sort of integrate those systems. I think whenever you're talking about integration with with third-party systems you know from an sap system to any third party um best practice is to leverage some solution and enterprise architects to really make sure that you know you guys are building the the right things and the reason that the, the answer is sort of generic is because the enterprise architectures that the sap s4 system sit on in the cloud in something like google azure or aws the technology that exists within those clouds is maturing, or I would say accelerating quicker than some of the core SAP technologies. And so what we see is almost different ways to integrate the systems. Every couple months, there's new technologies and new ways to do that. And so, you know, I think as a team, the recommendation would be to sit down between the SAP and the Primavera teams and really try and figure out with the enterprise architects, you know, what the future proof integration path is, you know, out of an SAP system, you no longer have to do things like IDOCs and change pointers. You can leverage things like the NetWeaver Gateway and the API Hub now to, again, in a more future-proof way, integrate, right? And so, you know, if a company has a standard connector, uh, that may be the easiest way. But if you're having to augment that and build additional in integration, I think you're going to want to spend some time and make sure you do that correctly. Hopefully that answers the question. Or yeah, at least he clarified that Primavera is from Oracle as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, if if uh, any other follow-up question, please, uh, Raldo, feel free to send it in the Q&A. Another two questions, uh, uh, Wesley, yeah. first is from Luis. He says if uh, uh, he would like to know how to access the Tosca TTA tool within SAP. Is that something that they can download or we, they need to contact uh, uh, Tricentis or SAP? Basically, how the, how that process works. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think if you guys, you know, contact sales at tricentis.com, um, they can hook you up with that information. And I can follow up some of this conversation with some of the links. Um, yeah. TTA, uh, so th there's two things going on. There is a freeware version of Tosca that is, available through uh, your solution manager licensing. And so essentially um, it allows you to complete some of the testing using solution manager. Beyond that, there is the more standalone version, which we call ECT, Enterprise Continuous Testing. And I think that is something that if you reach out to the, the sales orgs, there are demo systems and things that we can get you guys access to. So any of your systems that have a solution manager system with the appropriate licensing set up, you can access TTA. And then for things like ECT, you guys need to contact Tricentis and we can help. Yeah. Um, we can help do that. Thank you. So, so Luis, I think that you got the answer TTA through Solution Manager and, uh, 
an easy day, just feel free to reach out to me. And I believe we have exchanged emails in the past. So that's great. Yep. Thank you. Uh, another one. Uh, and I believe this, this is coming in your presentation, but just so that you know, there is a, <laughs> they're very interested in, in this topic. Is there any estimate or metrics from Tricentis on how much effort can be saved by running testing automation on greenfield or even brownfield implementations? Yeah, I think some of that was back up in one of these, you know, these are sort of industry benchmarks that we've um, collated over time and seeing gains as much as 10%, right? Lowering cost by as much as 50%, that's the resource reduction and effort. And then the one area that's not always talked about is, is the risk coverage, right? And we are gonna get into this. To me, one of the most important aspects of all of this is around uh, the hits and the gaps, right? Leveraging something like Live Compare to systematically tell you where the risk exists, right? And where you already have coverage versus where you don't have coverage. This is one of the biggest areas where you can actually help reduce the time spent testing, right? And we're definitely gonna talk about this later. Um, in terms of Tricentis, we have tons of metrics and success stories. So Juan Carlos, you can help me send some of that out. I didn't load this presentation down with that content, but we definitely have tons of that stuff. I mean, uh, we helped Bose, you know, accelerate their testing by something like five or 10 X. I mean, they went from doing two releases a, a year or one release a year to doing a release every six weeks. I mean, the acceleration is crazy when you really start to one, figure out where your exposure is, i.e. your risk. And then once you have these automated regression suites built out, the ability to rapidly test, the ability to automatically feed data and consume data, um, it is powerful. Um, and the, the results are, are definitely there. Good. We'll do, we'll send, uh, in addition of your presentation, other detailed information on success stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Good. No more questions. We can continue. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And so, you know, when we start to go down this path, we want to make sure that we're asking some of the right questions. And so these are just questions, you know, from my mind. But, you know, as you guys go to engage with your SAP clients, right, you know, we want to understand what the high level SAP landscape looks like. You know, we want to understand the scope of the project. When we talk about implementing something like automated testing and change impact analysis, some of the questions that were asked in the chat, we really want to figure out, you know, and my recommendation is to figure out an area where we think we can benefit most from some of this testing. You know, implementing automated testing, you know, across an entire SAP program, across order to cash and procure to pay and finance and warehouse and inventory and logistics and all of these other modules can be daunting. And so kind of some of the recommendation is to try and highlight areas and work specifically there first, prototype get it up and running and then expand to other areas. And so that could be something as simple as starting with procure to pay or with your SD processes. Um, and it could be as something in a big, you know, two year program where you're gonna implement S4 and it's Greenfield and everything else, right? Again, either focusing on specific business processes or um, specific integration points, right? Again it's a lot to, to break down all at once. And so some of the area or some of the recommendation is to start in smaller areas, prove it, get the teams up to speed and then continue. Um, core and integrated technologies is right in that same, same vein, right? If you are implementing a new integration architecture, then maybe it makes sense to start to build Tosca to test some of that first and then expand into SAP. It can go either way, right? Um, at Tricentis, we offer, we offer, um, packaged applications for things like ServiceNow as well as Salesforce. And so again, the SAP landscapes are always bigger than just SAP. And so we're trying to always understand what else um, we can test and where else automated testing can help. ServiceNow is one area. I don't know if you guys have worked on many clients, but typically as a client, we make our ServiceNow instances very complex, tons of rules, and ultimately it becomes quite a burden to maintain. And so uh, at Tricentis, we have uh, package application testing offerings for things like ServiceNow. Um, to one of the questions that was asked earlier, this is a bit of a segue. Do you have an ALM system? Are you trying to preserve any of that existing automation? And then the next question, what about your current and future deployments of Solution Manager? And so 
one of the things we see in the U.S. is a lot of clients don't use a lot of solution manager, right? They use it for things like documentation, maybe some of the health monitoring of the systems. Whereas in Europe, right, we see much more robust deployments of solution manager to help maintain the SAP applications. This is processes and things like that are all stored up there. And that's where the integration or the offering through Tricentis TTA, if you have a pretty built out solution, right? TTA can logically help get a bunch of coverage right away, right? If you don't have that solution manager built out, that's something where, in my opinion, ECT becomes more meaningful because, you know, for the TTA stuff to work, you really have to build out some of the content and solution manager. And that in and of itself could be a three month, six month, year long project to do. Whereas you can directly start with the automation and something like ECT. Um, and then project teams, right? We're trying to probe and understand um, because the partner network, Tricentis ourselves have deep relationships with IBM and Cognizant and Infosys and Accenture, et cetera. And so, you know, depending on the nature of the project and who's in the mix, right? It's not impossible to get resources through the SIs who have been trained and sort of upskilled on some of the Tricentis offering to really help some of these projects and help accelerate some of that, um, deploy, build, getting everyone up to speed. Wesley, just, just to add a, a couple of points, also in addition of those global partners, we also have some, uh, uh, let's call local system integrators in Brazil, like uh, uh, Veris Brazil, uh, Uyaman, and then we will also have an extensive uh, network of partners in, in, in Brazil and throughout Latin America. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Um, this is an area that we're, we're growing you know, every day. We have big teams of dedicated enablement teams that are out there trying to upskill and, and get the Tricentis message and tool set training out there. Um, and it's actually cool because it's something we're starting to see on resumes um, when, we, when we're on these big SAP projects. Um, so it's cool. It's definitely a skill that should pay dividends um, in the long run. And so now we're going to talk about Greenfield, right? And so one of the asks was a bit of an overview on what just some of this terminology means from someone who's done some of this, right? And so the Greenfield option is definitely the preferred approach. This is what I recommend companies doing. I think there's levels of depth that you could go in here, but it's, it's really this net new ERP system and it's an ability to start fresh again. What we see in a lot of these legacy ECC systems is so much customization, so much data, so much complexity that the customers really can't meaningfully or sustainably maintain those systems anymore. And so realizing that, having the new S4 platform with all of its new capabilities and features, you really get a meaningful chance, right? Um, leveraging, you know, with my solution architect uh, hat on to really jump from all of that complexity, all of that burden to something fresh, something simple, something more standard, right? Um, all while preserving, you know, the core business processes, the core functions that you need to do, right? And so this is around re-engineering and process simplification. It's a chance to cleanse, convert, and master your data, which is really around introducing data governance so you don't end up with all of this meaningless garbage data in your system. Um, in the slide, there's a great article from Deloitte here that talks all about the, the Greenfield stuff. And yeah, this is kind of my preferred method. I think when you talk about benefits, it's the clean slate, um, addressing deep rooted technical issues. So, you know, you're going from these big on-prem data centers, right? With your big ECC system to typically, you know, what SAP would consider an on-prem, but you're doing a private cloud-based S4 system. So it's going in Azure, AWS, Google Cloud, any one of the local providers. Um, and last time there's a bunch of people who are hosting these systems now. Um, you know, you really get to the opportunity to address a lot of those deep-rooted issues. So, you know, flat file integrations, really complex IDOC and middleware solutions. You know, you don't have to keep and convert a lot of that over. There are better ways to do it. SAP has introduced BTP and BTI, which is the new platform for integration, um, as well as all of the hyperscalers offering their own proprietary mechanisms, as well as competitors coming in with all of their solutions now as well. Um, you know, when we talk about the adoption of best practices, it's 
It's really getting out of this mindset of our business is so unique that we have to do things certain ways. And certain customers always have some of that, which is fair, but we cannot let that mindset proliferate through the entirety of it. When we talk corporate procurement, purchase racks, POs, et cetera, it's much easier to leverage SAP out of the box than it is to try and change, retest, and then support in perpetuity those changes. And so as part of Greenfield, that's part of the mantra is we want to bring things back to a simplified core. Um, on the downside, these are typically more complex because we are talking about re-engineering the entire process. They are typically more or most expensive because of all the person hours involved with doing those assessments and really figuring out what it all should be, which results in a longer timeline um, and typically more change management. If you guys have any questions on Greenfield, let me know. What we do now in this um, presentation is just lay out an example, right? And so a lot of folks have never been involved in some of these greenfield, brownfield, et cetera. And so what we did was just lay out an example project, right? Which is sort of a hodgepodge of various things, but is meaningful and contextual to what we see going on in the industry, right? And a lot of these you'll see resonate in some of the success stories and everything else. So in this example, we set a hypothetical oil and gas company, right? They have operations in a few different countries. And as part of that, they have multiple ECC systems, right? In these different, com in these different countries, right? So, you know, two in Europe, one is on-prem, one is already in a private cloud, one in Africa, right? And then two in the US, right? And in this example, and this is funny actually, because I, I actually, did a little work with SAP Brazil back in the day. And so I know some of the complexity that it, that it exists down there. This is, wasn't actually created for you. This was actually created for something else. And I had the Brazil example in here, right? And so, you know, there are, because the rules and regulations are so complex in Brazil that some of these solutions like Primavera and others are, you know, actually preferred to some of the SAP uh, systems because of, you know, the SAP localization and everything else. And so, you know, in this example, we have one system in Brazil. Um, and so the example project scope, you know, having all of these systems, five ECC and one legacy non-SAP system, right? It would not be unheard of for a company to try and come and consolidate two of the ECC systems. In this example, I said the two in the US because they're in terms of, um, you know, regulations and et cetera, the, the, the most similar. Um, and we laid out an example timeline that is, you know, although hypothetical, definitely realistic, right? Um, the majority of the companies who end up with these highly complex systems, it's, it's not because they wanted to, right? In this example, in oil and gas, oil and gas has all sorts of merger and acquisitions and they happen very fast. And as part of that, they end up sort of commingling multiple systems. So they, while they are one company, right? They, it's typically easier to have a reporting layer above an SAP system that rolls all the reporting up so that you can deal with your financials while still allowing the individual entities to operate within that system, right? Um, right now, there is a big shift to simplify internal operations. So that's where the commentary around simplifying the madness, right? When you have multiple systems, you have to have multiple teams managing those, and then you need teams who manage across multiple systems. So that complexity just adds time, delays, everything else, right? So there is a definite shift to continue to simplify. Um, there is obviously the cloud shift going on right now. I think various companies are in various states of the cloud shift, but everybody has stuff in the cloud and is moving more and more and trying to get out of the on-prem data centers. Um, and in this one, we said the USA was gonna go first because the business process is most closely aligned, right? So hypothetically, if you had two different oil and gas entities that joined as part of a merger and acquisition, they're gonna be doing a lot of very similar things in those systems. And so it's not unheard of to try and bring those into one system. So what we did was lay out an example high level architecture. So again, we're always trying to show that the complexity exists not only within the SAP system, but also across the entirety of the landscape. So you have your core SAP system, your S4 HANA system in the middle. We have a couple really standard SAP solutions that exist with most folks who do things like procurement within SAP. And that's the open text integration as well as VIM, which stands for vendor invoice management. Ariba, again, a standard integration exists and we see many people using Ariba. 
And then what customers tend to do beyond that, maybe in a phase two type activity, or as they continue to build out their SAP system is, is actually start to integrate directly with their suppliers. So, you know, we are now in a point where, you know, I can send my purchasing activity systematically without a human ever touching it, other than entering the order all the way to my supplier. And I can get those goods delivered all the way to my central warehouse. So the next time someone deals with it is when it's received in the warehouse and the, the follow on documents are all created. And so again, there's a lot of complexity in there. The supplier integration portion is typically more custom in nature because the supplier is gonna have their systems and their process, et cetera. So you're gonna have to string that stuff together. But, but these are kind of common things. Um, moving down the diagram, solution manager is, is a part of every S4 and current ECC uh, deployment. But we also see connectors and integrations being created to things like ServiceNow. So there is an integration now that exists between ServiceNow and Solution Manager when you have system failures based on your technical monitoring and your business process monitoring of the application, where it'll actually automatically create ServiceNow tickets, right? This is, this is cool. ServiceNow and JIRA, right? So you could have a ticket go right to a defect and things like that. Workday, um, I threw in here because I have some experience with Workday. Workday is a, is a competitor in the entire US HR market. Um, we see a lot of customers integrating Workday to their SAP systems now. Um, continuing up, customers are always going to have a series of homegrown applications and reporting solutions and everything else, as well as in the US um, or for any oil and gas, you have all of your metering solutions. And this is where we're trying to bring in, you know, the capabilities of some of the new SAP systems with the IOT integrations. So things like smart meters. So, you know, utility companies that are using SAP, all these smart meters that exist on everyone's houses can actually feed all the way in. Banking integrations for everyone who's ever worked in the SAP FICO space, right? We always have banking integrations. And then in the US, we integrate our SAP systems um, or can integrate our systems to state, uh, federal and regulatory institutions. So we can, you know, systematically be sending out these layers. And so, you know, all the way back to the questions of, you know, knowing what to test, how to test it, and does it scale? All three of those questions have to be answered across this landscape, right? We have, you know, standard integrations that exist between something like SAP and Ariba. We have custom integrations potentially between SAP, Ariba, and our suppliers. We have custom integrations going to other third parties. You know, we have standard connectors and things. And so, you know, in terms of knowing what to test, it's going to be based on what's changing. Testing itself is with ECT or with Tosca. And then, you know, the opportunity to load test, all of this stuff exists, right? When we consider the oil and gas metering solutions, which is just my generic term, this is high frequency streaming data, right? So that's something that definitely needs to be performance and load tested, right? Testing things like disaster recovery scenarios and resiliency, failover, right? There's, there's many areas to, of testing that are involved in these, these big projects. Um, to continue on these big projects, right? Um, we're seeing a definite push to Agile. So the Agile methodologies, the, the one that is most common is uh, kind of Scrum. At least that's what I see the most of. So people are sprinting, Scrum leads, or Scrum masters, testing leads, cutover managers, and so forth, right? It is not uncommon in a big greenfield project to have 10, 20, 30 project managers, right? Uh, the data migration is an area uh, where, you know, data validation starts to come into play. And so, you know, you're migrating data, you're taking potentially gigabytes and terabytes of data, right? There's a, there's a whole overhead associated with that. Uh, your build, config and testing, these are your iterative phases within a project uh, in which your end-to-end -end scenarios are built, right? I always like to use an automotive example. You don't just build a car all at once. You build components of a, compar components of a car and then in a, you know, assembly plant, all those uh, components and parts are all put together, right? And an SAP project is, is very much the same. You're going to start to incrementally configure, build, and test. And when we talk about shift left and, and room for improvement, someone asked the question around, you know, how, or someone asked the question, do we have benchmarks on, on how much customers are saving? And so we're going to provide that information. 
But the point I want to make here is during your build config and testing, this is where you actually make those savings, right? Or where the savings are realized. <clears throat> and that happens by including the Tricentis tool sets and the methodology in the build config and test phases. Meaning as I build objects, I at the same time build my automated testing so that I can use the automated testing, right? To test my build and my config. But then I can also use the features that exist within Tosca to actually increase my capability and test beyond just what, I, what I've created. And so the perfect example is I'm deploying a purchasing scenario and I can very quickly go in and test, does this work for company code 1000? Does this work for plant 1001, right? Using the automation by a, literally selecting a couple checkboxes and what we call enabling our combinatory logic you can actually say, test all combinations, right? So I can create a purchase rec creation scenario and say, test all combinations and specific steps. The system is actually smart enough to go into the application, look at all the available options in the various SAP dropdowns, and by itself, go and test all of those combinations and then give you a big readout of, of where it's working and where it's failing, right? And so the savings are created by leveraging the tool to increase the individual's capability um, beyond what they can meaningfully do, right? If you were gonna sit there and test every company code, you'd have to sit there and do that. By letting the automation do it, now all of a sudden you get the coverage, you get the benefits with, with none of the effort. And so, you know, that's where that 10X savings comes. If you're doing it once for company code 1000 and testing all 10 company codes, you know, you just saved that, that 10X effort. Um, Continuing down the list, when we talk about operational change management, it's not a common to have a bunch of these folks running around. And I think there's there's benefits in terms of the automation for, for these folks as well that aren't really accounted for um, all too frequently. So if we're using automation to test, you know, folks who have to sign off and SOX and compliance, uh, regulatory and audit, right? They now have a robust set of history of everything that's been tested. They can see, all the data that was tested, when it was tested, what systems it was run on, who tested it, what user accounts, everything, right? All of this starts to exist in this ecosystem as we start to leverage this, right? As well as now having all the business processes recorded, you can now feel better about what was tested. You can you know, measure the completeness of that testing systematically. And you now have a, a pretty rich repository of what was tested and how it was tested. And you can actually start to fold that information in towards the creation of your training material and everything else. And so, you know, some of these benefits come through the usage of these tools and the maturity of the, of the implementation, right? Hypercare or, you know, what has been called early life support, right? This, this is typically a two week, six week, three month, six month process after one of these big projects goes live where essentially the project team is really just sorting out anything that didn't make it, you know, broke when it went live, et cetera, right? There's always some issues and little bugs that need to be sorted. And again, the tool set that we talked about rapidly helps you sort of understand the problem, understand was it ever tested? You know what I mean? What sort of training, all of that, as well as when you use something like change impact analysis, when you create a change to fix that problem, you pass it through change impact analysis, it's going to then real time go and look through your system and see how this change, the fix you're introducing, actually proliferates through the system. It's gonna give you your hits and your gaps. It's gonna tell you, here's all the testing you need to do. The newest release of ECT in Tosca or um, CIA and ECT actually can automatically go run those test case for you. So saving more time as well as telling you the gaps. Um, and so again, a lot of the benefits come from really getting the tool set ingrained in the, in the program so that you can realize these benefits. Um, I think ongoing. So again, at Tricentis, we're always trying to look at what's next. So what typically happens in these large SAP projects is no one really considers the ongoing support. The entire program is focused on getting the S4 system up and live, right? And they're trying to hit their dates, their timeline, their, their budget, et cetera. And so one of the first things that goes is always this, you know, automated testing capability. And so 
you know, part of the message is that we have to invest the time during the program to build the automation so that we can then immediately realize and support um, the application once it's live, right? So an SCP project ends, but there's always a phase two, there's always a phase next, there's always everything you didn't get as part of your initial project, right? There's everything you were promised and didn't get, everything you need that didn't make the cut, right? There's there's always this de-scoping of items as we progress through. And so by using the automation in the earlier steps, we're really trying to decrease that list as well as set the program up for success once it is live. So, you know, by taking the time to do the work to create the automation during the project, you now end up post go live with a full regression suite. You can immediately hit the ground running and start working on those objects that didn't make scope, testing them, you know, with the automation that you have, right? And really accelerate out. Um, you know, I've seen projects go live and spend a year stabilizing their system, right? With the Tricentus tool set in place or had that Tricentus tool set in place, you know, we could have cut that timeline down by six months, by three months, by nine months, right? It is it's not uncommon to see a, a very quick acceleration if the right tool set is in place. Um, yep, questions if you guys have them. This is kind of to really talk about within the SAP project, right? So these SAP projects always have big test cycles and we always used to call them SIT1, SIT2, SIT3. You could have as many SITs as you want. SIT stands for System Integration Testing. And these are typically incrementally scoped, right? You're gonna test more and more as more and more is one data loaded into the system as well as config and customization and RISEF are all built in, right? Um, these are typically time boxed. The entire program typically stops or at least most of it. And you're really gonna start to focus on testing your end-to-end -end capabilities of the system. So this is testing the data loads. Do I have my materials and customers and vendors and all of that stuff, right? Have I loaded all my cost centers and chart of accounts and, and everything, right? I'm then gonna to start to test my business process on top of that. Can I create a rack? Can I create a PO? Can I convert that PO to an invoice? Can I pay the invoice, right? In the SIT cycles, we're testing incrementally through this, right? So as more data is loaded, i.e. maybe more complete sets or more organizational type data, maybe now I'm gonna enable company code 2000 and 3000 and 4000. I'm gonna to need to go back and rip through that content. Um, with the automation in place, like I mentioned, you can essentially one click extend your test scripts to cover more and more combinations within the system, which really takes a huge amount of manual testing load off the individuals expected to validate and confirm all of these operational scenarios, right? Um, as we get further down, what you're gonna see SAP programs do is start to pull in non um, project team members. So they're gonna pull in business folks to really start to test and validate um, how does this look, right? We're gonna bring in someone from accounts payable. We're gonna bring in someone from the warehouse who's using the current warehouse systems and really see for some of the first times how this SAP system works, right? One of the final test phases that happen in a project is what we call user acceptance testing or UAT. There's typically only one of these, um, maybe two. This is gonna serve as your final approval. It's not uncommon to fly entire business teams in, right? So all the people that use the warehouse systems, the current warehouse systems, we're gonna bring a bunch of those people, we're gonna marry them up with the SAP program team and we're gonna sit down and we're gonna go through a user acceptance testing cycle. And so again, this is where you know the application using something like ECT, right? We're really gonna be able to demonstrate that we've one tested all of this stuff, but then using features like the recordings and everything else, we're really gonna have new content and new ways to engage these folks to, to help get them comfortable with what is going on within the application. Um, yep, continuing on. So back to some of the challenges, you know, what will be impacted, what should we test, what tests do we run, and what is our test coverage? Um, you know, without a set of tools, you really have no good way to understand what is impacted within the application. So, you know, I'm a solution architect, I'm gonna work with an ABAP team, we're gonna create an integration or we're going to create a customization or an enhancement within SAP. We really don't know what that's going to impact by any of the sort of 
standard tooling that exists, right? Because we don't know what's changing, we don't really know what to test. So we're going to know what we want to test, right? But it's this concept of what we call unknown unknowns. I don't know what I don't know. So I'm going to make my best educated guess. I'm going to really try and understand what I think I need to test. But what I really need is a tool in there telling me, you know, here is what you need to test, right? And that needs to be based on, you know, things like machine learning and everything else, a, a real-time assessment of the system and the usage. You know, what tests to run. So if I have an automated testing repository, you know, knowing what of my, you know, 100,000 scripts need to be run. What we're trying to do is break down the legacy mindset. Legacy or that, you know, historic thinking would say, we'll just run the entire regression time every or run the entire regression test suite every time. And what we're saying is that's an inefficient way to do it. That's a fine way to do it, right? But that doesn't do anything for gaps in your coverage. So it can give you a false sense of security as well as being somewhat of a time suck because half the stuff or 75% or 90% of the stuff you're gonna actually run in that regression isn't going to test what is actually changing, right? And that gets to the last challenge, which is your test coverage. It's about feeling comfortable with what you've tested, right? If you have unknown unknowns, then all you're really doing is addressing that first layer. You know, this is changing. We think it impacts these couple things, so we're gonna test that, right? And so really it's around trying to bring a confidence to the testing. And, and this is areas where, you know, I've personally been burnt. Um, you think you understand the coverage, you forget something, you go live, you know, and now all of a sudden you have unwanted integration volume or you didn't test mass changes or you didn't test that random scenario um, in order to cache that actually relies on this process, right? Things always break. And so again, we're really trying to address these concerns. Talking about greenfield versus brownfield. So just to give you guys a, a brief on the brownfield, you know, brownfield is, is as I said, you're gonna try and take as much of your ECC system, your processes, your data, your integrations, et cetera, and essentially convert those to an S4 system. It is not a lift and shift because ECC sits on a traditional database and S4 sits on HANA, right? So not a lift and shift, but you know, the point is, you know, greenfield and brownfield, there is there is always some nuance in these things. So, you know. When you consider a greenfield, you're still going to bring a bunch of your original data. You're just going to cleanse it. But you know, a lot of that data is still the same. A lot of the table structures between ECC and S4 are the same, right? So there is some nuance there. Um, and now we see other industry partners creating new colors as well. So things like bluefield, right? Um, you guys can can Google the bluefield. It's essentially multiple big greenfields and some some big vision. Um, uh, and I just gave some examples, right? So a greenfield project plans to migrate materials as is. It's in, you know, their commentary would be, it's pretty good. We cleansed it a couple of years ago, right? So we're just going to bring it across. You know, um, another example, a brownfield project plans to standardize a core process and convert everything else. So now in this example, right, you're doing a brownfield. There's still areas of improvement that you can make and harness that aren't that huge amount of change that you're trying to avoid as part of um, a greenfield. And so the truth is there's blended shades of all these implementation strategies. This was just another visualization. So in this project, green being greenfield, you know, maybe we're, we're going to implement S4 and we're going to do a rebun. We're going to integrate our suppliers as part of phase one, but our banking integrations don't need to change much. You know, our open text and vendor in invoice management processes, they're not really changing, right? So a lot of it is around that nuance. Continuing on. We'll talk quickly about the DevOps, right? And so I'm a supporter, but also somewhat critical of, of DevOps and CIC CD pipeline as it relates to SAP. So first we're gonna talk DevOps. You know, everyone that has an SAP system has a big support org taking care of that application. The move to DevOps really sees two main duties, right? One is supporting that application. And that's gonna be things like, you know, my user account doesn't work. I'm locked out. Uh, the application went down. We have to patch the application, right? And then you have this concept of, you know, continued build within the application. So everyone who has an SAP system 
has a backlog of items that they want and need, right? And so there'll be some internal process to curate and prioritize and, you know, essentially ultimately develop, build and deploy those new features, right? And so when we're talking DevOps, it's, it's this construct, right? You're going to have a team that supports all of the functions that you have, right? So basis, ABAP, integration, security, right? Those folks also support your, support your um, things like regulatory compliance, your audit requirements in the US, we have Sarbanes-Oxley, things like that, um, as well as teams that support all of your functional modules, right? So this can be everything well beyond what's here, right? Order to cash, procurement, finance are just some of the big ones. Um, you know, the, the Tricentis tool set is designed to support and accelerate these areas of, of SAP sort of maintenance and ongoing development um, as well. And so it's not anything specific to um, greenfields or brownfields, right? The next is around CI CD pipelines, right? And so if DevOps is the process of running and improving your system, CI CD is the technology used to implement those changes, right? And I think, you know, what we notice is more and more agile being common, right? But from an industry standpoint, standpoint, I think the SAP practices themselves are pretty immature, right? Compared to globally what we what we see. And so um, I think the SAP practices are, are growing and agile is becoming more and more. But again, agile is a journey, not necessarily a destination. And so um, I think we just keep that in mind. Um, some of the challenges in terms of CICD are largely driven by the monolithic nature of SAP. Right, and the lack of external tools supporting that, that source code um, management. So SAP has a very robust source code management in and of itself. So there really isn't this need for this CICD sort of pipeline technology. However, companies are going down this route. SAP themselves have um, a base version. I don't think it's released or anything yet um, where they are starting to do um, what we in software development would consider you know, as a, a true pipeline with a with a GitHub repo and source and change control and all of that stuff. And so it is an area that SAP is going to evolve into. And I think as SAP grows, we'll see more and more of that. But I still think just at this point, I would call um, this space relatively immature to, to other areas of, of software development. Um, you typically, in terms of DevOps, have what we call release cycles. So, you know, you're releasing software as frequently as every two weeks, right? Maybe you have a concept of major or minor releases that are maybe more aligned with like a six week kind of thing, as well as customers still being quarterly, um, once or twice a year even. And so again, when we, when we talk about the benefits of the tool set, this is again where those benefits can be realized, right? By having something that speeds your development by telling you where your changes are and what needs to be tested by automatic by automatically kicking off the testing by generating those results that's by telling you where you have gaps in your testing right um you know that is how we come through and realize um some of these these benefits and so now a little bit more into just the tricentis stuff right and so you know Traditionally, the nightmares of automation, and one of the reasons a lot of people don't pursue some of this are, are these kind of what we've dubbed the three nightmares, right? Versus the maintenance trap, right? And so we see a lot of this with legacy <clears throat> HPQC or micro focus um, tools, right? You have all of these static test cases that have no mechanism for managing the data, have no integrated way to performance or load test, you know, have no real integrations with the applications, have no integration to know what is changing and what tests need to be run, right? And so it becomes a maintenance nightmare, literally, to try and maintain all of this. And one of the areas we see a lot of uh, traction with the Tosca toolset is with companies who have big centers of excellence, right? Who have operational centers who deal with a lot of the testing and maintenance of these systems. Because the capabilities exist now to more closely integrate with and understand what's changing and know what to test, et cetera. I mean, it's an area we're really trying to reduce. Test data management of same lines. I briefly mentioned that, but you know, back in the back in the days, five, 10 years ago, right? You had to say, I'm gonna use 
company code 1000, I'm going to use vendor 1000, I'm going to use, you know, this purchase order type, et cetera. That becomes a nightmare, not only to maintain, but there was no management of the data. And so some of our tool set, which we'll talk about in a second, actually has ways to go get data and bring data in. So you can essentially curate meaningful data sets and then a trigger your execution to run to just pull from those data sets. There's, so there's ways to refresh that data, keep it evergreen, keep it up, allow the system to determine what data needs to be used, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, the last pain point is around test system provisioning. This is typically for larger clients and bigger projects. You guys have all probably been in things where we have what we call an N plus one environment or you're setting up test load clients or temporary test data clients, right? There's no mechanism um, to, to quickly and efficiently deploy the infrastructure as well as pump it full of meaningful data. So back to the slide, what to test, does it work and does it scale? We're always focusing on this. So I have this slide in here twice to kind of talk about that, right? Knowing what to test, does it work and does it scale? And so now this slide kind of talks about the, the automation offerings that we have, right? So these agile continuous integration and delivery system simulation. So we have something we call OSV that allows us to do two things. Um, not sure if you guys have heard of this, but um, synthetic data as well as simulation. So synthetic data is the ability or the capability to create data sets to be consumed by the application that have been de-identified and or masked. And so, you know, there are all of these data privacy laws coming. There's one gonna come out of California later this year where you're not allowed to use customer data. So the days of simply taking your SAP production system, replicating it back to QA, and then taking all of your customer data records and testing your end-to-end -end processes really shouldn't be doing that anymore. And so you know, synthetic data allows you to look at the needs of the system. I need a, in terms of a customer, I need a first name, a last name, a zip code, and an email address, as an example, um, to create data sets for consumption and load and consumption into these systems, as well as simulation allowing you to create simulated integrations. So you guys have probably all worked at, you know, customers who, have a production integration, but they don't necessarily have that same integration running in their QA system, right? What simulation allows us to do is actually, I don't have a better word for it, but to actually simulate that integration in QA as if it was running. So you could have via your automation in ECT, right? Log into the SAP system, consume some synthetic data, and at a point where it would go and logically hit an external integration, we can actually simulate that integration, return the results to SAP <clears throat> to allow SAP to continue in the end-to-end -end test case, right? And so now we have ways to meaning meaningfully generate system load, both synthetically and by a simulation, where we actually don't have certain data and we don't have actual integration in place, right? Risk-based test design, right? This gets into the offering of CIA, which I've talked a little about and we'll talk more about in a second. Distributed re remote execution. So again, you used to have to essentially sit there while the execution ran. What we can now do is distribute and execute that stuff remotely. So I can say, I wanna run these 10 test cases. I can double check my data is all good, et cetera and I can click and Dex will take and run. And I could say, I want this to run from one user or five users or 10 users, right? And it um, will automatically go, you know, instantiate the user accounts, get into the SAP system and, and test um, these components that you've identified. Test data management, I briefly spoke about. This is an area that we are investing in right now to make more, you know, specific SAP solutions around test data management. I think SAP and a large package applications have some of the most complex data requirements. As you guys all know, uh, the SAP data systems are, the, the data relations are, are quite complex. Um, we also have our test automation for non-SAP. So we have offerings for ServiceNow and Salesforce, as well as being certified to test any of the other sort of core technologies, right? all the database stuff, everything in Azure, Java, HTML, all of our PDF, Excel, all of that stuff. 
So pretty cool. We can pretty much test anything from mobile to mainframe. And that's where, you know, to the SAP scope, you know, we're not bound by, by really much other than the, the imagination these days, as well as the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. There, there is a lingering question on, on TTA and Solman, but, uh, no. uh, uh, but l let me first clarify for everybody that uh, uh, TTA is basically allows you to do just the bottom part of that uh, graph that Wesley just presented and everything else, the, uh, uh, the test automation on non-SAP test data management, remote execution, risk management, system, uh, SOB or system simulation, as well as uh, CD, uh, CICD, all that is part of the, what we call the enterprise continuous testing for SAP. So it's much more complete package. See the TTA as a, as a, start, um, as a way you can start getting accustomed to, to the solution uh, and might be valid for some customer, but it's very narrow in terms of the scope if you compare to really the full needs that you need the enterprise. But the specific question, Wesley, and please correct me if I mentioned something incorrectly, is that uh, does TTA requires Solman or, or is that a tool independent of Solman? Yeah, so TTA does require Solution Manager. Um, yeah. When you're in Solution Manager and you deploy the TTA um, content, right? The transports and the infrastructure, et cetera. What you see in Solution Manager is a way to automatically, ta you know, to essentially click and create and run automated testing directly from Solution Manager. So TTA exists as part of that and Solution Manager is required. Um, what I was speaking about over here on the left is the larger offering from Tricentis. And Juan Carlos, you summed it up perfectly, right? I think, you know, TTA has a very specific scope because it relies on Solution Manager and the content that exists in Solution Manager to go and create that automation. And so it does punch out a Solution Manager and come into the same sort of ECT or Tosca window where you maintain your modules and everything else, but the scope is bound um, to those solution manager integrated scenarios. Whereas ECT, enterprise continuous testing, right? All the stuff on the left is the extended feature set that exists as part of everything that we offer, right? And so the partner networks are being trained um, and enabled on both. Um, and so if you guys have more questions on that, yeah, feel free to ask. Thank you. Um, Continuing, yep, and that was sort of it at the bottom, right? TTA um, for SAP, we, we just spoke about at length. And so now, you know, I think we've got a little time left, right? So- Question, by the way, Wesley, is exactly, yeah. uh, because it's how the solution detects change impact. And I believe uh, it's a perfect- That's what we're gonna talk about to literally right exactly. here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and so great question, great segue, right? And so, you guys can read through the text a little bit. It analyzes your SAP system and usage, right? So the SAP system itself is tracking the usage. The SAP system knows all the users, all the transactions, all the function modules and baddies, and literally every technical component in the system. It knows what's using those and how many times those are being used. And so what CIA, or what we used to call live compared does, is it, is it monitors those, right? So it has the direct integration with your production system. We then have some machine learning algorithms in there that are you know, understanding that data. And then what it's going to do is when you create a change in SAP, you create a transport, right? So everyone knows what a transport request is, right? That transport request is going to contain a list of the technical objects, configuration, everything you're changing. What CIA is gonna do is it's gonna read through those technical objects that are changing it's then gonna do a couple things. It's gonna go read through that usage in your system, right? And it's gonna figure out where those objects are being used, okay? And it's gonna generate a risk profile based on that. So what you'll find is, you know, a transport may be touching an object that was used, you know, 200,000 times. And it's also using an object that's only been used five times in the last six months or whatever range we've set on this analysis, right? And so based on that understanding, right? And this is where some of the machine learning is, it's gonna generate a risk profile on those objects. It's then going to do one other thing with the integration with ECT. It's going to compare those same technical objects that's changed to the usage in your system, to the technical objects that are contained in the test scripts that you have. 
And that's how it knows, here's what's changing, here's what you need to test. And oh, one of these objects that's changing, I'm not getting any hits in your test repository. And it is of a relatively high usage in the system, right? So based on that analysis is where you get your risk-based testing guidance from. So um, please ask if that um, makes sense. And if not, I can talk more about it. Um, but it's very cool. It's all systematic and it's really as simple as first deploying the solution, right? So you got to hook it up. You got to integrate it to your ECC or your S4 system, right? Once it's hooked up, it really is just a process of pa passing in your transport numbers, your, your request numbers. You pass those into live compare it through an RFC connection, right? Goes up into SAP and starts to complete this whole assessment for you. Um, and what we see is, you know, similar to the, the capabilities here on the bottom, right? So many capabilities used, so many impact, but very little of that being at risk, right? And what we're doing is we're starting to increase the individual capability of both, you know, the users as well as the program to more, to have a better understanding of, again, those three questions, what is changing and knowing what to test. Right? If, if I don't know what's changing, how am I supposed to know what to test, right? And that's where CIA comes in. Um, the next slide is to ECT itself, Enterprise Continuous Testing, right? This is where you actually go in. So there is a, a you know, standalone application is actually part of a platform where you go in and you create your model-based testing. Um, there's tons of content out there we can follow up with. There's YouTube channels and document, not documentaries, but like tutorials. And we have tons of help. There's a whole community forum going on as well. Um, but this is where you come in and, and build your model-based testing. And so the key here is model-based. And so, you know, a test case or a test script is nothing but a series of mod modules. You make those modules small and nimble. So again, what we would do would be create a module that logs into SAP with a specific username and password. That username and password would be stored in a secure location and is actually part of your test data management, right? Because different test cases are going to have different user requirements. So as part of that module, we have a pretty elegant way to say, you know, I need these users for these types of testing, right? You then come on and again, create your modules. So you create a module that creates the header of a purchase rack. You have a module then that fills out all the line item details of the purchase rack. You have a module that would sort of approve or complete that purchase rack. You would then have a module that converted it from a rack to a PO, right? And, and so on. And so what you then are allowed to do with those modules via test data management as well as test case design is really figure out and map the the broader multi-scenarios through a given module. So an example would be, I have a purchase rack. And as you guys may know, I can typically buy materials or services, right? Or something like a free text item through um, a purchase rack. So I can create one module to manage the creation and the entering of those details. And in what we call test case design, I can now have the variations built out there. So variation one is going to be for a material. So I'm going to get an item from material master. I'm going to pick a vendor that supplies that material, which will derive the pricing, et cetera. The next one would be around a service. So in test case design, I can say now step, you know, variation number two is for service. So it's going to be a free text. So we're going to have it type in some text. We're going to have it pick a vendor that is enabled for service procurement, et cetera. Right. So Again, very elegant ways to reduce the overhead associated with all of this. And in that test case design is where on specific fields that I'm interacting with, I can go ahead and use the combinatory logic to say things like test all combinations or you know, uh, things like linear expansion where the system will, will actually de derive a meaningful path um, through. And so again, ECT is incredibly powerful to the questions about TTA, um, TTA has a somewhat narrow scope when it comes to some of this, because again, it's really relying on solution manager to essentially set up
up what some of the requirements and scenarios are, and then that information flows into TTA and TTA X. Uh, Wesley, um, uh, uh, so a couple of questions. Uh, one, going back to the chain impact analysis is, do I need to map my ABAP objects and my business processes in Solman to run no. change impact analysis? You don't. It's it's agnostic of, of everything. It's it's a real-time integration into your ABAP system, be it ECC or S4. And so there is, other than integrating, creating the connection between live compare or uh, change impact analysis and that ABAP system, there, there's no mapping, no business processes, no no nothing needs to be done. You literally just take your transports, pass them in, and it, it starts to generate that profile for you. Yeah, uh, if I may add a couple of comments also based on yeah. the experience uh, implementing this in Latin America. One, uh, uh, some of our clients doesn't even have, have are not very much in the automation process, okay. but they are manual process. They do the impact analysis is still significant amount of service, even if, if, and we have some cases like Bose that uh, very well-known company, that was the, the situation, but ve very useful, even if you are not in a mature phase on, on uh, test automation, that's number one. And the other is uh, fairly easy to do a POC with uh, uh, impact analysis. So please, if uh, it might not take us a more than a couple of days to, to run a comparison between a couple of your systems. And so you can demonstrate and, and really build, we can help you build uh, a business case on how a, a tool like this will significantly impact your uh, your return of investment and the benefits in your company. No, that's one. Yeah, hundred percent. And I would Good. plug one more thing: is mm -hmm. that everything you said is a hundred percent. We have uh, within Tricentis what we call our value engineering team, and they can actually help support in things like um, return on investment analysis as well. So, right. You guys and us, we can coordinate on pilot teams to go through and build pilots and demos and everything else. And then this value engineering team can spend some time with us and you guys and the clients to really understand how much effort are they you know, spending now? How much can they save? And then you know, what else are we missing? Because you know, a lot of what change impact analysis helps us derive is it helps cover risk that we didn't know we had, right? So that's kind of a challenging thing to to quantify, you really only see it, or I'd say the only time you see it is when you have production outages after you've imported or released things into production, right? Or you have a big surge in demand, which puts load on your SAP system and you see your, some of your integrations fail, right? You only ever see the symptoms of not addressing your risk proactively. And so that's where, you know, some of these specialized teams uh, in coordination with you guys can definitely lead some some sessions to help um, unravel that stuff. Yes, uh, another question and just maybe another comment there that although we focus on impact analysis, the tool also provides you another, a lot of functionality like the check the quality of your code uh, yeah. and, and many other things that are very valuable. Uh, the other question from Anderson is, uh, uh, and I, uh, so it means ECT can simulate dependent systems and uh, in that way, we can have server virtualization for interface, interfaces, APIs, et cetera. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely it. And so there is, um, for sure, both the ability to create and consume synthetic data as well as simulate um, integrations, just as you described, for sure. Okay. Thank you, Anderson. It's, so go ahead. the statement was correct. Go ahead. I think that we have five more minutes. So we need to be wrapping up, but great session cool. so far. Yeah. And so the last one to, to really cover is the our newest acquisition and, and integration. Um, so what we call enterprise performance testing or EPT. This is where our load and performance testing um, comes into play. And so, you know, in the days of Load Runner, if anyone's familiar with that, you know, in HPQC, you'd have to go in and create all your test cases, and you'd have to have manual test cases for every company code. In Tricentis, in, in ECT, we've already broken down that you can have very few modules by a test case design and test data management testing a whole width of scenarios, right? So now, with the integration with EPT or performance testing, 
I can select any of my test scripts and modules and essentially set them as performance testing relevant or select them as a candidate to performance test. And this is where it's really cool. There's a configuration screen where I would go in and I would say, okay, I'm gonna highlight all my scope. I wanna test purchasing, sales order, inventory, whatever, right? And then I would say, I wanna test this for 10,000 users or 200 users or 5,000 or 100,000 users. I would then have the ability to say, I wanna test these 10,000 users across multiple geographies. So I want 5,000 users in LATAM, I want 5,000 in North America, 5,000 in Europe, et cetera, right? And what will happen at that point when you go to complete or when you go to execute your performance test is that the system goes and via a series of load generators creates virtual machines, right? So virtual machines get spun up, each of which will handle a number of concurrent users based in the geographies that you've selected and execute this performance testing based on the scripts or the modules that you've selected. And so the difference is you, in LoadRunner, you used to have to go and create tests and everything manually in that system. Now you have this one-click capability across your entire um, repository and a way to really test anything. Anything that you've created in ECT is now a candidate for load testing. So you have the ability to say or answer the question, this integration works when we do a SIT or a UAT or um, when I have multiple DEX users running, right? But how is it going to work for 100 users, 1,000 users, 10,000 users? How is it going to handle the, the Cyber Monday traffic of, you know, 100,000 users, 500,000 users? With EPT by Tricentis, you, you can now answer that question. So you would simply select all of your modules, your test scripts or your test execution that hit and leveraged all of your integration points, right? Set up your performance test and click execute um, and come back in, in X number of minutes or hours and verify your results, right? Um, it is pretty powerful stuff. And I think with that, this shows that, right? So EPT, you have all of your controllers, the load generators spin up, the load generators are what actually integrate or connect, not integrate, but log into the SAP systems and or any other system that we've talked about. Anything that ECT can test from mobile to mainframe, EPT can now come on top of and generate this dynamic load. So it could be a, a mobile handheld service. It could be a, hitting a mainframe, an integration, loading Excel, any of it. So, yep, I'm trying to cut myself short. That's the last slide. That's all yeah. I wanted to. Perfect to timing. Perfect timing. So, thank you so much, Wesley. Uh, uh, from our side, we will make sure that the, uh, uh, you all that attended, we will receive not only the uh, the presentation, the recording, and also we will provide the via Suji our contact information. So, if you need to. Um, contact us uh, to have a more detailed conversation or do a pilot in your installation, more than happy to do that. So, pessoal, muito obrigado.